beginning, there was darkness, and then bang, giving birth to an endless expanding existence of time, space, and matter. Every day, new discoveries are unlocking the mysterious, the mind-blowing, the deadly secrets of a place we call the universe. Among the swirling gas and dust in the arms of the Milky Way, stars flash into existence, not alone, but in clusters held together by the force of gravity. Gravity is like the sculpture of the universe. Now, take a grand tour of the galaxy's star clusters, the treasure maps of space, holding critical clues to the mysteries of the Milky Way's 400 billion suns. Star clusters really allowed us to get a handle on how stars go through their lives, how they live and die. It's a violent, chaotic existence where our search for cosmic clusters may end up revealing a universe in darkness for eternity. About a thousand stars are visible to the naked eye during a dark night on planet Earth. While the glistening display may impress us, there are places in the galaxy where the view would blow us away. Imagine the sun on the edge of a giant cluster made up of a million other suns, filling the heavens horizon to horizon. The stellar density is really high. The distances between stars can be just a few hundredths of a light year, or something like that. The galaxy's magnificent clusters are more than just beautiful to look at. You may not realize it, but they hold the very secrets to the way stars are created and how they're destroyed in massive supernova explosions that generate the very elements of life. Our search for cosmic clusters begins not through the eyepiece of a telescope, but in the cockpit of an interstellar spacecraft. Our mission? To traverse the galaxy and find out why clusters are so valuable. Why they are keys to unlocking the mysteries of the stars. Our first stop? The Pleiades. The most famous star cluster of all. 440 light years from Earth. Known since antiquity, it contains a thousand stars though only a handful can be seen from Earth. The Pleiades are the so-called Seven Sisters, a bright, easily noticeable grouping of stars in the winter skies. Well, it turns out only six of the stars are easily visible. You can see six, and really sharp-eyed people can see eight or nine or ten. Rarely have I met anyone who can see precisely seven stars. So maybe in antiquity, there was a star that was considerably brighter than it is now, but it has faded since then, so now there are only six easily visible stars. There are actually hundreds of stars in the Pleiades, perhaps up to a thousand. We circle the Pleiades in search of clues that can reveal the secrets of the universe, because clusters hold the key to understanding how stars are born, how they live and die, the secrets of creation. Like all clusters, we see that the stars in the Pleiades are so close to each other, they are all virtually the same distance from Earth. Of course, the stars in a cluster are not all exactly at the same distance from us, but they're so far away that the slight differences in distance are really pretty small, they're inconsequential. A nice analogy is viewing a stadium full of people from a blimp high above. From the perspective of the blimp, most of the people are at about the same distance. Most of what we know about stars, their size, weight, and age, comes from figuring out their inherent brightness. But you can't judge a star's true brightness without knowing how far away it is. That's where the cluster comes in. The fact that all stars in a star cluster are basically the same distance from us is very important. It gives us a sample of stars where we can actually see what the intrinsic, real brightness of these stars are. 
Unless we know these stars are all the same location, we don't know whether we're looking at a bright star that's far away or a dimmer star that's close to us. There's no way to tell. But in a cluster, all together, you can see that. The same rules that apply to stars in the sky also apply to cars on the road. What we have here are two cars, same make, same model, so we know the headlights on each car are exactly alike and equally bright. From where I'm standing here, one car's headlights look just like the other. That makes sense. But now, let's make these cars act like stars in the universe. Same stars, but at different distances. OK, Amy, back it up. Look at these headlights now. The ones over there are much dimmer than the ones here, even though we know they're the same. This is the inverse square law. If that car is twice as far away, then the headlights are four times dimmer. If it's four times farther away, the headlights are 16 times dimmer, and so on as far as you care to go. But sometimes, a light that appears to be dimmer actually is. This flashlight and the headlights are just like stars in a star cluster. The flashlight next to the headlight looks dimmer, and that's because it is dimmer, not because it's farther away. A dim star next to a bright star in a cluster looks dimmer because the star itself is dimmer, not because it's farther away. Up close, we see the Pleiades has a mix of bright stars and dim stars. And it's this very variety of different stars in a cluster, all in the same place, that solves the puzzle of stellar evolution. Star clusters really allowed us to get a handle on how stars go through their lives, how they live and die. Think of it this way. If an alien wanted to learn how humans live and die, but they could only watch us for 30 seconds, they flew by Earth, and they took pictures of millions of humans. Even though they couldn't watch a single human live and die, as a group, they could piece together our story. They looked at some babies, they looked at older people. A star cluster is just that. It's a single snapshot in time, but there are stars at every different part of their lives. And that was the tool astronomers needed to piece together what a stellar lifetime is like. We know that the biggest, brightest stars are the most dangerous, so we keep our distance. These are the live hard, die young stars of the universe. Those that expand to giant size before going supernova. The dangers lurk even in clusters with appealing names, like the Jewel Box. But the next stop on our journey is a place in the sky very familiar to people in the Northern Hemisphere. We are 80 light years from Earth, approaching the closest cluster to our planet, the Ursa Major Moving Group. As we bring our starship around, we see five of the central stars in Ursa Major form what we know as the Big Dipper. People notice that they actually move across the sky together. With most constellations, the stars, even though they look like they're part of the same constellation, they're actually completely unrelated to each other. They have nothing to do with each other gravitationally. However, the stars in the Ursa Major moving group actually formed at the same time and are part of the same moving group. In time, the movement will change the appearance of the familiar pattern of stars. We're visiting Ursa Major to explore another cluster question. Why are some more spread out than others? Irregular in shape and scattered in appearance, they're called open clusters. An open star cluster is a relatively loosely bound aggregation of stars. They form in the spiral arms of a spiral galaxy, and then they gradually move away, and then they disperse. Scientists believe virtually all stars are born in clusters. But as time goes on, the stars in open clusters get scattered apart by the gravity of other passing stars. That means most clusters are young, because otherwise, their stars would no longer be in clusters. A star cluster is kind of like this pile of confetti on my hand. Gravity gradually pulls the stars away and disperses the cluster. Well, I can blow on this pile of confetti and disperse the pile. Let's do it. Now, if this were a star cluster instead of a pile of confetti, 
then gravity would be the agent that gradually pulls the stars away, dispersing the cluster over time until there's little, if anything, left.